and also sanjit this would be uh, we would be providing the ppt and recording this would be on the iscm website for the candidates only so that they can come back for it so okay. today's important lecture is on the pressures and curves uh, uh, pressures and maneuvers that are important for uh, proper implementation of uh, respiratory support both uh, in invasive and non-invasive so we have uh, none other than dr sanjeet sashidharan my very very close friend and we all practice in mumbai now i am also a mumbai car and sanjeet is the all in all of raheja hospital lesson raheja hospital and sanjeet has even come up with a vip icu concept one one of his own kind and he himself is a uh, good academician clinician as well as a top class researcher with a lot of interest in ventilation nutrition then uh, infection control stewardship and he has he himself conducts a annual ventilation program uh, which is due in the month of december so guys you can come that it would be a very nice experience to have proper interactive courses in that uh, the ventilation itself then he does all this thing of ventilation uh, learning on a simulator itself so it's a simulated learning so we will send you the details of it it would be on 17th and uh, 18th december so you can connect myself or dr sanjeet directly for that so today sanjeet is going to uh, speak on ventilator pressures and maneuvers over to you sanjeet the stage is all yours yeah thank you dr arindam so well i have been uh, called by uh, by dr arindam to actually take uh, a, a real real a real real basics about uh, ventilators and i think uh, each one listening to this particular lecture needs to understand every bit that goes in teaching this party thing so um, i've been told to talk about p peak p plateau pressure p recruitment a little bit tpp and i have p0.1 and proning so these are the entire thing that i need to talk about it's a long way to go definitely a very long way to go and let's take it first from basics okay unless you understand basics of any subject we probably will not understand terminology we will not understand what this is about so that's why we get into the basics first so let's talk about compliance now compliance is something that we must understand first before we go into any of these pressures that we talk about compliance is the ability to inflate the ability to to distend or the ability to stretch that is what is compliance this is what is compliance whereas elastance is the opposite of compliance in fact it is the inability to get back to what it was is called as decreased elastance if i would call it so that means to get back to its original sense is called as elastance in short compliance and elastance are actually just two different uh, two opposite sides of the same coin the opposite of compliance is elastance and the opposite of elastance is compliance it's as simple as that so ability to distend is compliance ability to go back to its original condition is called as elastance so increased elastance actually equates with a decreased compliance means it's a stiffer lung whereas decreased elastance equates with increased compliance means more easily inflatable lungs so this is very important to understand because the further lecture is going to be based on compliance which is nothing but the energy cost of breathing so now this distensibility of the lung is actually dependent on elastance on resistance and on inertia so let's go to one by one okay so once air is moving inside there is going to be a resistance if there is a resistance to inflate the alveoli this is called uh, this will lead to decrease compliance that means increase airway resistance or an reduction in increasing the uh, the chest wall up and the alveoli up would cause would mean decrease compliance anything that causes a uh, resistance in the airway or a resistance to inflate the alveoli would mean decreased compliance when i say alveoli it means alveoli and the chest wall that would be decreased compliance well um, if i uh, this is what is airway resistance whereas 
uh, lifting up that is actually called as elastic resistance. So uh, lifting up the chest wall, lifting up the alveoli, that is called as elastic resistance. So both of these would actually combine together to decrease compliance. Well, what is and why is this so important? Because it is the airway resistance that is the first topic that we talked about, that is P peak. And that would actually depend on the length and radius of the airway lumen. That means you use a smaller tube, you use a six number tube versus you use a nine number tube, the resistance would go up because the length has increased or the radius of this particular airway lumen has kind of reduced. Similarly, if there is bronchoconstriction, in a spontaneously breathing patient or subsegmental bronchi, there is going to be a reduction in the airway lumen contributing to an increase in the airway resistance. Meanwhile, if there's an increase in the viscosity or density of the gas mixtures, there is going to be an increase in the airway resistance and an increase in the P, P peak. That is the reason that sometimes if you were to use laminar airflow with the use of helium, uh, a low density uh, mixture, uh, of air, oxygen, and helium, that is heliox, there is going to be a reduction in the resistance. Meanwhile, also the ventilatory flow rate, that means higher flows, higher resistance, and the pattern also makes a big difference in the peak pressure. So this is what the first topic was, peak pressure. So peak pressure is uh, is goes up when the radius of the lumen comes down, the length of the lumen goes up, the viscosity of the gas mixture or density goes up, and the flow rate kind of alters. Now let's go to high flow. What happens with the flow rate? When you get up in the morning and you actually go to the wash basin and you want to actually increase the tap in full flows, what's going to happen? This water is going to go and splash into your face. This is the wash basin analogy for flow. Let me put this to you more care, more easily. Now, what you're seeing on the left, the blue dots is the laminar airflow. Okay, that means air is flowing very clearly, very slowly towards the top without a problem. Now, let us do something called as non-laminar airflow or turbulent airflow. When you have turbulent airflow, it will hit the walls. It will hit the walls of the entire air, airway, causing an increase in the resistance. And that is responsible uh, and that is caused because of obstructions, because of high gas flows, and because of bifurcations. When these three things are going to occur in the airway lumen, there is bound to be an increase in the resistance. So what I've made you understand is that laminar airflow will cause a reduction in the P peak, whereas an obstruction and a high gas flow will cause an increase in the P peak because the airway resistance actually goes up. Hence, to reduce the P peak, we need to ensure that we use the lowest possible flow to meet the demands, simple. Okay, at the same time, we have to remove all obstructions like a kink in the tube, like a mucus in the tube, like some kind of obstruction in the tube, maybe a bronchoconstriction. We need to get all that, get around all that in order to reduce the P peak pressure. So I, I hope I've made it understand as to what the P peak is all about. I mean, with these diagrams, you should probably be, it should be very simple for you to understand that the pair pressures are basically the airway pressures that we talk about P-peak. So let's go further now. Now this uh, air resistance is going up. That is why the peak pressure is going up. And what is normal airway resistance? The normal airway resistance is 0 0.5 to 2.5. And when you put a tube inside, it the normal is 4 to 6 centimeters of water per liters per second. Anything that is abnormal is more than 15. Okay, if it is more than 15, there is bound to be some abnormality inside and that you need to correct. Now, when we see that equation down there, we are saying estimated airway resistance is PIP, that is the P peak or the peak inspiratory pressure minus a new terminology called as P plat or the plateau pressure divided by the flow. Now, let's go and understand what is the difference between the peak pressure and the plateau pressure. Let's go and understand that now. Now that we know what's the peak pressure, let's go and understand what is the plateau pressure. So uh, lung distensibility actually depends on resistance, inertia, and so we talked about resistance. Now let's talk about elastance. When we talk about elastance, we'll understand what plateau pressure is all about. So let's go to this diagram back. So as air is going inside, there is an airway resistance, but then the air has to go through the alveoli and distend the alveoli. So the first resistance that we are getting after causing, crossing the airways 
is the alveolar resistance or the elastic resistance that is seen from the alveoli and that is amplified because of a large amount of problems in the interstitium which includes interstitial fibrosis alveolar fibrosis position of the patient abdominal organs atelectasis loss of surfactant trauma and pain not only that this elastic resistance also is responsible for raising the chest wall you understand so it is not only alveolar pressure it is also the chest wall pressure and if you want to divide them between two it is static compliance and dynamic compliance we'll come to that too as to what this is all about well compliance is the change in volume divided by the change in pressure now what is the static compliance it is after all the elastic resistance that we just now talked about the static compliance is the elastic resistance well that is what is measured by the plateau pressure the trans alveolar pressure or it is in short the alveolar pressure is what we are going to mention measure when you look at the plateau pressure what is dynamic compliance dynamic means there is some movement and that movement is because of the flow which thus relates to airway resistance hence a combination of elastic resistance from static compliance and an airway resistance actually gives you the peak pressure i hope i have made it quite clear the dynamic compliance is actually signifies peak pressure but the static compliance is the one that actually shows alveolar pressure or plateau pressure let's look at our ventilator so this is our ventilator you know our ventilator looks something like this this is what we see in the ventilator we see this particular graph which is actually what we are trying to understand peak pressures and plateau pressures let's come to uh, let's dissect this graph completely so this is p1 this is time and let's see how this graph is formed so we'll understand what is peak pressure we'll understand what is plateau pressure what you see as p1 is the airway pressure at the mouth opening what you see as p2 is the pressure just near the alveolus and what you see as r is the resistance of the airway and what you see on the graph down here on the x axis you have time and on the y axis you have the pressure this is what you see on the ventilator the pressure and versus the time okay and we are talking about a volume control mode which is the commonest used mode in usual ventilator settings this will make us understand what peak pressure and plateau pressure is all about now how does air move from p1 to p2 it will move from p1 to p2 only if the pressure at p1 is higher than the pressure at p2 when this occurs you first see this particular graph coming up this rise in pressure is what is seen and air and there is a flow of gas which is responsible for distending the alveolus so it distends the alveolus because of the flow of gas okay and then next thing what happens is the alveolus goes up and you see a rise in the pressure now what you're seeing here is the peak pressure the top is the peak pressure and then it comes a situation where there is a uh, there is a halt in the inspiration because the p1 becomes equal to p2 that means there is a pause and when that pause comes down what pressure you are seeing down there is actually the plateau pressure it is a pressure as a result of removing flow as a result of removing flow and this is called as a plateau pressure or elastic resistance that we talked about then what happens next p2 becomes more than p1 and air rushes outside when air rushes outside the alveolus goes down and you find the graph actually going downwards now if the pressure goes to zero you will find the entire pressure curve coming completely down completely down so let's dissect this out once more okay so this what you see is inspiration uh the top of this curve is peak pressure this curve this uh, the, the the plateau over here is called as plateau pressure okay now this is very clear now what we are seeing over here is because of resistance this particular slope is because of resistance and the top is because of delta p divided by flow at the peak whereas this b is the compliance that is nothing but change in volume by change in pressure this equation is very very important for us to understand change in volume by change in pressure what does the p, p plat do how do you do this all that will do for finding out plateau pressure is press the inspiratory hold for a period of around 2 seconds when that is done you get a pressure on the wave on, on your ventilator which is called as p plat and the normal values that we need uh, that we see is less than 30 anything above 30 is known to be injurious ventilation uh, as per studies what can we measure we it is actually the representative of the alveolar pressure or the static compliance as we understood it will tell us the resistance of the chest wall and the lungs 
and it will also help you to understand airway resistance if you do an inspiratory hold uh, maneuver once the inspiratory flow is absolutely constant in fact plateau pressure is also one of the best representative to figure out what is intrinsic peep which is a build up of pressure inside the lungs which will cause hemodynamic embarrassment now let us take this in the other way let us understand what this plateau pressure is and how that how we are measuring this plateau pressure as a static compliance airway pressure is equal to resistance of airways plus alveolar pressure this is what is airway pressure now what is resistance of airway resistor airway is the flow multiplied by the resistance and what is alveolar pressure it is volume over compliance plus peep whatever peep you are giving that is uh, alveolar pressure well if i make the so, so go back to this diagram what we are seeing on point b is delta v by delta p so if i want to uh, replace this volume over compliance i will get delta pressure that's what it is when you look at this particular graph okay well when i do an inspiratory hold what is happening when i'm doing an inspiratory hold the flow is actually stopping so once the flow is stopping into resistance that particular equation becomes zero and all you are left with is volume over compliance that's why alveolar pressure airway pressure becomes equal to the alveolar pressure that is how your ventilator gives you the plateau pressure and thus you can approximate that to the static compliance or the tissue or the alveolar compliance is what we are assuming with respect to the plateau pressure now what happens if the pressure falls to zero when the pressure falls to zero you will have the entire alveolus to collapse now that we've understood peak pressure we've understood plateau pressure we're going to another important terminology so once the pressure falls to zero you have the alveolus completely collapsing completely collapsing that's what happens when the pressure falls to zero as seen in the graph down there where pressure has fall to zero the pressure over time graph now when the when it goes when the when the pressure increases the alveolus increases that means there is a increase in the size of the alveolar and a decrease and if it becomes completely zero the entire alveolus will actually collapse now this repeated opening and closing of the alveoli would cause a large amount of damage to the lungs we cannot allow this to drop down and that is the reason we wanted to remain we wanted to remain elevated and we add a pressure at the end of expiration when we add a pressure at the end of expiration this is what the graph looks like you have the pressure trace again and then this is how it looks like that means there is a pressure at the end of expiration as i told you in the earlier graph this is where the expiration is and that is why you are getting uh, you are getting this uh, uh, the, this is called as peep well uh, this peep ensures that a alveoli does not collapse at the end of expiration and that is why this is called as positive end expiratory pressure the alveoli remains thus inflated that is what is the peep that's what you look at when you look at the graph this is what you look at in peep what does this peep do it has got a huge amount of things remember this on your ventilator whatever is the curves are there the blackness more amount of blackness more amount of curves means more amount of pressure means more amount of oxygenation so if you get the peep up you know you have more amount of elevation of that particular pressure so more oxygenation it displaces extra vascular lung water it maximizes recruitment and thus the frc it importantly prevents atelectric trauma and biotrauma which occurs because of repeated opening and closing of alveoli it decreases an inflammatory response you know mechanical ventilation is an inflammatory response that is what everyone should understand our entire role is to reduce this inflammatory response and we can reduce this inflammatory response by actually giving peep and hence now at this particular moment there is absolutely no role of zip or zero end expiratory pressure all patients on the ventilator needs to be on a positive end expiratory pressure a peep has to be dialed in on your ventilator also because it is also known to decrease your left ventricular afterload well this is our inspiration this is our so going back to what we till now discussed this was our peak pressure this is our plateau pressure and this is our inspiration and expiration let's see this on a graph let's see it on our uh, on our uh, ventilator graph how this looks okay so this is inspiration this is expiration that's the flow graph below it flow versus time you have inspiration you have expiration okay this is what the entire graph is about the flow phase then you have a pause that's why you have the pause phase and that is where you are actually starting or stopping the flow and then the new flow starts after the pause phase gets over this is what all it is about so this is our ventilator what you are seeing on the first graph is pressure versus time the second is flow versus time and the last is volume versus time so this is our graph you know this is what we see in most of our ventilators so this is pressure over time flow over time and volume over time now let us go back to this pressure graph to understand what we have just now learned all right this is pressure uh, time graph this is the pressure time graph that we are seeing 
all right so this is our inspiration this is our expiration and when you see that curve coming down somewhere here this is the pause phase this is the pause phase and then comes your expiration so when you see this expiration that is you if you the pause there is no flow happening here there's absolutely no flow happening over here between uh, uh, between the peak and the plateau that's why it's reflected on the uh, on the flow volume this is your inspiration phase and this is your expiration phase so what you see on the top is peak pressure what you see down there after the pause is the plateau pressure and the inspiratory phase and the expiratory phase i hope i've made you understand how to locate peak pressure and how to locate plateau pressure on uh, on the waveform on a dynamic waveform if at all you are not doing the inspiratory hold okay which is the so now let's go to we we learned about peak pressure we learned about plateau plateau pressure but let's look at something very important what okay but there's a chat uh, that has come in let me see what that is okay nothing okay all right so which is the actual pressure that is imposed on the lung that is see we are worried about pressures in the lung so which is the actual pressure that is imposed we talked about plateau pressure we looked about peak pressure we thought that plateau pressure is the alveolar pressure we talked about peak pressure being airway pressure airway resistance but what is the actual distending pressure of the lung what exactly is the actual distending pressure the lung distending pressure is actually the transpulmonary pressure that is alveolar pressure minus the pleural pressure that is the real pressure that is the problem pressure that is the pressure that is exerted on the lung so let us figure out uh, uh, let us figure out how to do this so let's go back to our graph this is our graph this is uh, p1 over p2 and that's how the peak pressure goes up now what we are assuming is that this is the peak pressure and then we are actually saying that there is a plateau pressure but what is important for us to understand is we are not only totally distending the alveoli we are also raising the chest wall we are also raising the chest wall or the pleura and the chest wall the pleura and the chest wall that is why the actual distending pressure of the lung is alveolar pressure minus the pleural pressure and that is what the transpulmonary pressure is all about so a transpulmonary pressure is alveolar pressure that means plateau pressure minus the pleural pressure and what how do you measure the pleural pressure by esophageal manometry and with esophageal manometry we will understand the pleural pressure so that's what the entire pressure is all about this pressure is not judged by your plateau pressure this pressure that is required to increase uh, to raise up the pleura raise up the chest wall that is not judged by plateau pressure and that is what you're going to judge by your esophageal manometry and that combination is called as transpulmonary pressure that subtraction of alveolar pressure minus pleural pressure is transpulmonary pressure let's take the example of this this is a spontaneously breathing patient what you see as red is the lung is assumed the lung and what you're seeing down as blue is the alveolus this is a representation okay the pleural space pressure is minus 3 this is usual in our minus 3 minus 4 is what we have if the alveolar pressure is zero the transpulmonary pressure becomes zero minus minus 3 and that is why it is positive so this that is why it is positive and because it is positive this alveolus is lying completely distended that is why the alveolus alveolus is distended because the pressure is positive 0 minus minus 3 is plus 3 and that is why it is inside pressure minus outside pressure now let us take a patient uh, spontaneously breathing with a pneumothorax let's put a pneumothorax here. now the pleural space becomes zero so 0 minus 0 transfer pressure is zero so once it becomes zero this alveolus is going to collapse that is why in a pneumothorax patient we generally start getting a uh, uh, collapse of the alveoli now let's take the pleural pressure to be say 6 uh, uh, okay it is it is 6 uh, um, that is because there is some effusion or something like that i add a peep to this now what is inside pressure inside pressure is 6 outside pressure is 6 So six minus six is zero. Is this peep enough? It is not enough because six minus six is zero, and because of that pleural effusion, it has become positive. That's why the pleural space pressure is six. Six minus six being zero, you are getting a collapse of the alveoli, and that is why our patients of pleural effusions collapse. If this pressure becomes even more higher, if it goes even more higher, that is twelve. That means large amount of pleural effusion is there. Six minus twelve is minus six. so now the transfer pressure becomes minus 6 and that's why the alveolus actually collapses that is a collapse at exhalation that you are going to see in these particular patients at the same time if i would increase my peep to 
Now what is going to happen is because my peep is 12, the transfer pressure is zero. It may not completely collapse, but it will remain small. And then if my pool space again becomes 20, again my transfer pressure becomes now uh, negative. Again collapse occurs, collapse and exhalation will occur. In order to prevent that collapse, I need my peep to be higher than my pleural pressure. So 10 minus 6 is 6. My transfer pressure becomes 6. And that is why we are able to generate an expansion of the alveoli and the alveoli opens up. I hope I've made the concept of transpermi pressure clear. Are there any questions as of now? Are there any questions from anyone here? Okay, so there is a question that comes from Arnav. Uh, how do we determine pleural pressure clinically? So there is really no way to figure out pleural pressure clinically. It has to be done by monitoring the esophageal pressure by using something called an esophageal manometer. It is a device that uh, that is like a Ryles tube where you have uh, three ports of which one is a Ryles tube port, one is a gastric balloon, another is an esophageal balloon. You inflate the esophageal balloon. That esophageal balloon sits in the esophagus and it is just besides the pleura. And so you are able to approximate the pleural pressure from that, from that balloon. That is the only way we can monitor pleural pressure. But I can tell you for certain, I've been doing this for the past five, five odd years in my ICU. Those patients who've been resuscitated, those patients who are obese, those patients who have got big chest walls, these patients uh, have got definitely very, very high pleural pressures. So most of our ICU patients that we resuscitate they have got high pleural pressures and they cannot manage with low peeps. So the only way to measure trans pulmonary pressure is to actually at this moment. So what was done in the past? In the past in animals, they put these small chips, computer chips inside the pleura and they measured the pressure. But we can't do that in human beings. And that is why we have to use a surrogate. And the surrogate is esophageal pressure, which can be figured out by using a nutrivent catheter or a Cooper catheter. There are three, four catheters which can be used to actually figure out what the what esophageal pressure is all about. Well, um, let me go ahead. Okay, so over distension. So this is all about transpulmonary pressure. Now let's go to the another thing called as P0.1. There are a lot of re uh, re uh, reasons why you want to monitor the transpulmonary pressure and that will probably, uh, if there are any questions on this, I'd be glad to answer about it, but it's beyond the scope of this particular talk because I just had to keep the concepts clear. Well, what is P0.1? Now P0.1 is that slope that you are seeing down there after you have occluded all the valves on the ventilator. The moment you've occluded all the valves on the ventilator, the first 100 milliseconds that are coming in, 100 milliseconds that are coming in, that slope is actually uh, is measured by uh, the ventilator and that is called as P0.1. It is a mechanical index of the respiratory drive. It is seen on all the newer generation ventilators. You will find that figure on all your newer generation ventilators called as P0.1, which is automatically calculated. What you must understand is, well, if it is minus one to minus two, it is kind of normal. But if it is higher than six, minus six, that means there is excessive workload and it is a very high central drive. We can use this for a lot of purposes. Now, let me get back to this once more. So P.1 is P1, P2 is 0.2. The valve is closed away, inspiratory valve is closed. And this slope, P1 to P2 slope is actually your P0.1, which is monitored in the 100 milliseconds after the valve closes. Uh, these are very high mechanics, uh, uh, solenoid valves uh, and highly, uh, highly sophisticated software that gives us this figure called as P0.1. Where can we use this? What we know is that very clearly is that if the P0.1 is uh, alarmingly low, that is, it's very, very low, then the work of breathing is very, very high. So if the P0.1 is minus seven and minus eight and minus 10, that means there's a huge work of breathing. That is what we are seeing in this particular graph. That if the work of breathing go uh, is uh, when the P0.1 tends towards lower values, we the work of breathing actually uh, the uh, the higher values in the minus ranges, it is always better. Similarly, it can be used as a parameter in setting of pressure support ventilation. Well, it it is used when uh, if the P0.1 starts improving, means it can you can understand that your pressure support can be actually reduced. So we can use the P0.1 to actually guide our pressure support mode of ventilation. It can also help us to titrate PEEP in patients with dynamic hyperinflation. That is what uh, it is. More work of breathing means faster respiratory rate. P0.1 will change. And by looking at that P0.1, we can actually guide our hyperinflation. In fact, importantly, what you must understand is extubation failure can be actually uh, the diagnostic value of P0.1 is almost equal to what we regularly do, which is 
you know, the RSPI or the rapid shallow breathing index, which is frequency by tidal volume. If you look at the area under the ROC curve is 0 0.53 for frequency by tidal volume, whereas uh, for P0.1 is 0 0.59. And it gets even better when you actually multiply both of them together because the ROC curve goes to 0.61. That's P0.1. It basically helps us about to understand about drive, effort at settings. Well, before we get into the uh, next talk, uh, Sanjit, uh, one question, please. Yeah. From my end, actually. Yeah. Uh, I have always uh, studied about so way back in Neil McIntyre and all others, this P0 point NIF and all others. So, what is the practical application of this one apart from what, what is the practical understanding? What does it signify P0.1. It so is the, the initial, P0 effort, point, yeah, initial yeah. effort to initiate breathing or it is the overall uh, uh, a sort of complete package giving up a idea of the work of breathing itself. So what does P0.1 mean to us in a simpler terms? So first of all, where has it been validated to the maximum? So P0.1 has been validated to the maximum in COPD patients, first of all. Okay, so whenever the P0.1 is alarmingly high, that is minus seven, minus six, minus eight, the drive, the drive is supposed to be uh, is extremely high. When the drive is high, it means the work of breathing is high. So when we talk about effort and settings, to understand effort and understand settings, P0.1 though has been used, it has not been validated to understand effort or settings. So the only place at this moment, if you want to understand P0.1 is, is to use P0.1 is to understand about drive. This means to say that if P0.1 is very high, means the drive is very high and these patients have a very bad work of breathing. That is all that you can do. The rest of the things that I talked about, whether I could set the pressure support based on P0.1, these are only small studies that have come about effort. There are few studies that come in from Canada that actually talks about effort and P0.1 and people have actually titrated the pressure support based on the P0.1. However, it has not been validated for that. So the only place at this moment where you can probably use P0.1 is in a COPD patient for drive. That's what the P0.1 is. And a, a higher P0.1 means more negative, right? More negative, yes. More negative. more negative means the effort is excessive, the drive is too much, this patient is not ready for any kind of extubation trial. Um, and at this moment, I, I, the, the study that actually talks about drive is almost equal to that that talks about rapid shallow breathing index. See, R, RSBI is very much overrated. So RSBI is almost equal to P0.1. It is one of the armamentarium that we can use for our weaning and extubation predictors. But we cannot say yes. that this is the this is the only thing that can be used. It needs a lot of uh, 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 thinking behind and no, more studies to actually talk about P0.1 being the uh, a better indicator than RSBI because RSBI is the most studied of the lot. Shabir is asking how to check P0.1 in a ventilator. So on the P on the ventilator, all the sophisticated ventilators has got a special setting which says P0.1. It first of all, the newer generation ventilators, the uh, the Hamiltons and the newer GEs and all of these ventilators don't require to do any maneuver. It automatically collects uh, connects gets your P0.1 when the patient is on any kind of mode of ventilation because after all, it is just the slope that is going to be there uh, for the first 100 milliseconds of starting the ventilator. A certain older generation ventilators had got something, a button called as P0.1. But as of now, all the newer generation don't even have that button. It automatically calculates it. Figure out, go to your ICU, open up your ventilator, look at all the settings and you'll find P0.1 being continuously being calculated. It is very similar to plateau pressure. Initially, we used to do an inspiratory hold. You do an inspiratory hold, you press the inspiratory hold, you get a plateau pressure. Now, most of the newer generation ventilators, not newer, in fact, older also, have got inspiratory pause. And if you keep the inspiratory pause at around two seconds, you'll get the plateau pressure there also. So it's like an automatically calculated. In fact, there are guidelines now talking about continuous monitoring of plateau pressure. Fair enough. Please continue. All right. So recruitment. Uh, so now we come to uh, an extremely, uh, it, it looks, it sounds very nice that we want to recruit our patients. Uh, but mind you, this is one of the most dangerous and most challenging tasks that we need to do uh, in the ICU. And we should be very, very careful uh, 
uh, if we decide to recruit our patients. What you must understand is we are injuring the lung every time we recruit our patients blindly. This is very clear. As the moment you start recruiting your patients, you are inducing some kind of damage. Biotrauma, barotrauma, volutrauma, everything can occur because of recruitment. In fact, there have been studies which says if you recruit your patients, your interleukins go up. It's as simple as that. And that is why the concept is positive. The entire concept was based upon the fact that positive pressure can be used to open up areas of the lung which have become collapsed. This means to say it has to be used only as a salvage. It should not be used otherwise. So indiscriminate use cannot be used. Uh, that means you cannot use it on a routine basis. It has to be used only when there is a salvage. That means there is an oxygenation deficit. You suspect that there has been a massive collapse. You have got sonography explaining you the same thing. That is the time when you will probably use recruitment. It is not supposed to be done as a, uh, as a routine in ICU patients because it is going to incite damage. I can't emphasize this more. And there are many kinds of recruitments that have gone over the period of years. So in matter of safety, the lesser safer recruitment maneuvers are the ones that I've mentioned up, whereas the, the, the ones that you see on the bottom of your screen are the most safe kind of recruitments. So when you talk about recruitment, what we are seeing on top is the first thing is tidal recruitment. We have all seen that. If the patient is going down on oxygenation, you take an ambu back, you start pressing the ambu back and this patient's oxygenation goes up. Why does that occur? That occurs because you have given large amount of tidal volumes and that has caused something called as tidal recruitment. One of the most dangerous things to do in the ICU is to use an ambu bag. The ambu bag is like a murder weapon in the ICU because what happens now is your oxygenation has improved. But what you have done, you have caused huge amount of biotrauma because the alveoli opening, closing, Clo opening, Closing. What you must understand is this alveoli, there will be one alveoli that is big, another alveoli that is small besides this. And the, 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 the connections between both or the area between the both has got an extremely important um, role to play. That actually increases the stress. The stress razor that is between a fully en enlarged alveoli and a smaller alveoli is four times. That means the pressure is four times in this particular area between the uh, uh, between the alveoli that is there and the smaller alveoli that is there. You are trying to inflate your smaller alveoli, but in the bargain, when you give large tidal volumes, the entire air goes into the path of least resistance, which is the larger alveoli. So you may cause over distension, you may cause biotrauma, and you may harm this patient. So a uh, ambu bag should ideally not be used in the ICU unless you're about to intubate your patient. You can't use it for doing suctioning. So this is something that is seen in many ICUs, ambu suctioning. When you do ambu suctioning, you are causing damage to the lung. And what you're doing is your oxygenation is coming up, but you are actually causing biotrauma and atelectrauma. So tidal recruitment is one form of recruitment, but it is the most dangerous of all the recruitments. Then the other kind of recruitment that we talk about is incremental peep. What is incremental peep? You start at a low peep, start going up slowly every five minutes, every five minutes, every five minutes, start going up till you reach a situation where the saturation improves or you have to abort the maneuver because the hemodynamics have gone down. So at that moment where your saturation goes by more than 3% up, that would actually signify uh, uh, that you have achieved recruitment and then you have to go one step higher than that. That is what your recruitment maneuver is all about. However, incremental PEEP is they have tried to make it safe by actually using ultrasound. So you could use ultrasound, watch your alveoli actually going up. And with that, you will be able to try to make it safe. But this again is less safe because in incremental PEEP also you are actually raising stress. You're actually raising stress. The other one is decremental PEEP. You go up and then you start coming down. Once you start at 40 and you come down to say 20, uh, you're coming down, coming down, coming down. There will be one area where your oxygenation completely drops or your ultrasound shows you collapse. That uh, two above that area would be, two above that pressure would be your optimal peep. This is called as decremental peep maneuver. Again, 
you know, to start decremental, you have to first go to 40, isn't it? If you want to go to 30 or 40, you are causing a sudden increase in the pressure. And that sudden increase in pressure is highly likelihood that the biotrauma will occur. That is why all these maneuvers per se, uh, including the last one, which is the commonly used maneuver, the sustained inflation maneuver. We think that this is safe. It's really, really not safe also, because you are suddenly going up to a pressure of 45 seconds, of, of 40 or 45, keeping it at 45 seconds. Means you are inflating the alveoli with pressure for 45 seconds and then coming down slowly. This is called a sustained inflation or the CPAP maneuver. This is also called as a CPAP maneuver, but as by now you would have understood that anything that is fast will cause inflation of the already inflated alveoli and may not really result in the smaller alveoli from opening up. The recent maneuver that has been actually talked about is the staircase maneuver. Uh, we will discuss that uh, also. This is what the staircase maneuver is all about. What is the staircase maneuver? In the staircase maneuver, you start, you, uh, the, the ideal way to do a staircase maneuver is keep your driving pressure in track. What is driving pressure? Plateau pressure minus P. You keep the driving pressure at say 15. So if I have a peep of five, my pressure control, my pressure control will be, uh, will be 20. So the difference between pressure control or plateau pressure minus P is 15. Now 20 and 5, I will hold that for around 1 minute. Okay. And then I will go up from 5 and increase it by another 4. So 5 will become 9 and 20 will become 24. Okay. So the next pressure will be 24 and 9. The effective driving pressure is 15. I will keep that again for a period of around 2 minutes. Now, after that, I will start going up further up. So every time I'll go up by four, 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 but I'll maintain my driving pressure. And that is what the staircase is all about. So I'm starting with a pressure control mode. My peep is five. My pressure control is 20. And as I'm going up, I will keep my driving pressure like the way it is for a period of around uh, two, two minutes. That means I'm going up fast. I'm going up fast. Two, two minutes wise, I'm going up till I reach somewhere where the, uh, uh, the peep is somewhere around 30 and the driving pressure is 45 and, and the, and the peak pre and the uh, uh, pressure control is 45. That is the plateau pressure is 45. I've gone up and what I've seen, uh, what am I noticing in this? I am noticing for a step up of the oxygenation, the SpO2 has to go up by at least 3% or I should have ultrasound findings that are, uh, uh, that are, uh, that are signifying that my collapse is kind of coming off. Okay. But now once I have reached that finding where the SPO2 has started going up, I know I have reached, uh, I have recruited this particular patient. Then I will come down, but I will come down slowly. I went up by two, two minutes. I'll come down by four, four minutes in the same way. I'll come down slowly, 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 slowly by the same way till I drop my saturation. Once I drop my saturation, almost two centimeters of water above that pressure would be my optimal peak. So I have recruited my patient and then I have set my optimal peep. This is the meaning of a staircase maneuver. Now this staircase maneuver also can be alarmingly dangerous. And that is why they were law among the, in the trial, the EPVEN trial, where they actually did the stepwise recruitment maneuver, there were a couple of casualties. There were a couple of pneumothoraxes because at the same time that the driving pressure is going up, your pressures are also going up steadily. So this is uh, all about the staircase maneuver. However, if you want to be extremely safe, then you could do the last three of those, which is the FRC guided recruitment. What is the FRC? FRC, certain ventilators have got something called as a metabolic monitor. It has got a, a, a way to figure out the, ox, uh, the FRC inside a lung. So every time you do a small maneuver of increase of PEEP, you can calculate the FRC. At the same time, you can calculate the compliance. So if the FRC goes up, and the compliance remains like the way it is, means you are distending collapsed alveoli. You are improving collapsed alveoli. Then you again, uh, again go up on the pressure, the FRC goes up, the compliance remains like the way it is. You are actually getting better at your recruitment. If your compliance goes up, it is getting even more better. But there will be a time where the FRC goes up, but your compliance goes down. What does that mean? That is over distension. So you have reached over distension, 
you know that you are at over distension and now you stop your recruitment that might be even at a pressure of 14 a peep of 15 or a peep of 16 so you will by guiding with the frc you will be a little bit wee bit more safer uh, of preventing of 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 preventing too much over distension but you will still create some over distension that is very important for you to understand that you will still create some over distension so frc guided recruitment is definitely safer than blind recruitment when I come to esophageal pressure guided measurement recruitment, this is probably one of the safest way to do it because here, what am I going to calculate? Uh, here I'm going to calculate my transpulmonary pressure. With my transpulmonary pressure, I can find out how much pressure is going to the alveolus and how much pressure is going to the chest wall. With this, I can limit my pressure. I can limit my pressures to the safest zones of transpulmonary pressure and thus recruitment maneuvers can be much more safer by doing esophageal manometry and this electrical impedance tomography is something that really legends are made of with eit we can guide our recruitment in such a way that we know where our air is going so the distribution of air in the entire lung can be actually figured out by electrical impedance tomography and if anybody wants to understand any of these techniques please feel free to come to my icu and i can show you the frc guided recruitment i can show you esophageal pressure guided recruitment and i can show you eit guided recruitment all three maneuvers being extremely safe uh, i'm much i mean not extremely safe safer than the other maneuvers that we talked about which include staircase sustained inflammation inflation decremental incremental peep and tidal recruitment so if i don't have any of these things I will have to be very careful and probably at this point staircase maneuver if i don't have any of these things would probably be the way i would be recruiting our patients when to use it as i told you only as a salvage never as a routine so some people say okay if you have got if you have done extreme uh, suctioning then please recruit don't do that it's not supposed to be done if you have a drop in the oxygenation hemodynamics are maintained then you do a recruitment because the oxygenation is just not improving. Don't do it as a routine. Just don't do it after every suctioning. Don't do after every position change. Don't do after every tube change. Don't do that. Do it only as a salvage, never as a routine. You can probably exercise a little bit more, uh, 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 more recruitment if you have PPP, EIT and FRC. Otherwise, gradual, gentle recruitments are safer. Just by leaving PEEP at a slightly higher amount, will probably recruit your patients much better than the actual uh, uh, recruitment maneuvers that we do on the bedside. Okay, there's a question that has come in over here. Uh, for recruitment maneuvers, paralysis is required. Uh, so very good question. So if you are, uh, the question that has been asked is, for a recruitment maneuver, do you require paralysis? See, if you are going to use any of these FRC guided recruitments, yes, you will require some paralysis because of the fact that you need the uh, you need to watch the FRC. FRC is actually figured out with a very small calculation on the software on the on the ventilator. Otherwise, uh, uh, if you want to do recruitment uh, on a patient who's breathing excessively, you will not get proper recruitment unless you have actually paralyzed your patients. So you may you can do the recruitment without paralysis, but it will not. Uh, it will it will cause a lot of problems to your patients because of the fact that there will be huge disagreement when you do it. There will, the disagreement will be too much. So it, if you want to do a recruitment maneuver, yes, either deeply sedate your patient or paralyze your patient. But I would suggest deeply sedating is always better than paralysis because we know paralysis has its own set of problems. But more often than not, when your patient is having oxygenation failure, I am certain that most of your patients would be deeply sedated because you want to ensure good synchrony. So in short, when you are in that particular patient in which you're going to recruit is going to be that patient who's going to be on deep sedation, who is being synchronous with the ventilator. Otherwise, it is impossible to do your recruitment maneuver on a patient who's actively breathing heavily. In that patient, you can't do a recruitment maneuver. It has to be done under deep sedation. Now remember this, that means to say deep sedation is also equal to some amount of hemodynamic embarrassment. So be careful in a recruitment maneuver do not do a recruitment maneuver in a patient who is borderline hypotensive. Do not do recruitment maneuvers if you don't have an arterial line. These are all sine qua nons of doing such hi-fi complex maneuvers. You should have an arterial line. Beat to beat monitoring of blood pressure is extremely important when you are going to do recruitment. It is not something I can take lightly. If I want to do recruitment, there has to be beat to beat monitoring of blood pressure. 
what about proning no proning is something that has gained so much of superiority so much of improvement so much of uh, 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 publicity after our uh, after covid has come into us uh, covid has struck the world proning is something that uh, that uh, is probably one of the best maneuvers you can think about uh, if you have an oxygenation failure so uh, what is the entire concept the concept is that if conventional mechanical ventilation is subject you subject to your patient and this patient is sick on the lungs the posterior lung tissue turns atelectated that means it is de recruited it is de recruited that promotes more collapse that means one lung is uh, one part of the lung is one part of the alveolar is de recruited it actually causes the other part of the lung also to get de recruited it becomes a vicious circle one de recruitment causes the other alveolar to de recruit and then slowly 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 cyclically it causes persistent atelectasis and because there is a volume loss there is going to be less surface area less oxygenation and thus hypoxemia that's what uh, the problem with conventional mechanical ventilation is how does this work how does this proning work well proning works because of many proposed reasons one of the reasons that proning and that's probably one of the best reasons is it actually homogenizes the entire lung when i say homogenize the entire lung means different different alveoli or different different sizes becomes almost the same sizes and because of which the vq mismatch kind of improves if the vq mismatch improves the oxygenation improves so it homogenizes the entire lung from the the way that we just now talked about posterior lung tissue turning at electrolytic it homogenizes the entire lung and that's why vq mismatch changes the second reason that proning might work is because of the fact that the lung the heart per se now is downwards since the heart is downwards a good amount of pressure which was exerting on the lung because of the supine position because of the heart is now reduced so that particular area under the heart uh, where the lung is there is kind of free and that's why that particular area also gets uh, a good amount of oxygenation the third reason it might work is because of the fact that there is excellent drainage of secretions when you actually prone our patients the if you prone our patient this there is a good amount of secretion drainage that occurs from the oral cavity from the lungs into the tube and from the tube out so there is an extremely good improvement in 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 uh, in the oxygenation because of drainage of secretions so these are a few proposed mechanisms because of which proning kind of works and which patient should be prone so every patient who's fio2 is more than 60 and remember this every patient because of the fact that there is a mortality difference now very few trials if you actually google into pubmed and figure out critical care trials that have changed mortality you will find a handful this is one of the trials that has actually changed mortality so that is why don't just take it as an option you take it as a mandate if the pf ratio is less than 150 and the fio2 is more than 60% but not in these patients unless you have ventilated them for 12 to 24 hours of optimization on the ventilator that means to say if you have a pf ratio that is low and fio2 that is more than 60 don't just directly prone them wait for 12 to 24 hours more often than not if you wait for 12 to 24 hours this fio2 will reduce and you will no longer need to prone your patients now from where does this come this comes from the the trial that actually showed mortality benefit that is a prosever trial what do they do in prosever trial they exactly did this they waited for 12 to 24 hours with extremely good ventilation and what we discussed the recruitment maneuvers gradual peep titration transformative pressure guided recruitments they did all of these things for 12 to 24 hours gave them the most optimal ventilation and then if the fio2 still remained less uh, more than 60 and the pf ratio is less than 150 then they prone their patient so needless to say if that trial changed mortality we should probably follow the protocol that that trial had the prosever trial the famous prosever trial and that is those patients who should be proned and usually those patients who have dependent symmetrical infiltrates which you can easily figure out if you actually do your ct scan or you do a ultrasound you will know that if there are symmetrical infiltrates those patients actually do much better than those patients who have only one single infiltrate in one particular corner of the lung so if you have symmetrical infiltrates proning definitely helps these patients those who have elevated intra abdominal pressure there also proning is said to be much better and usually ards with extra pulmonary etiology they do very well with proning which patient should not be for the whole list there's a whole list of patients that should not be proned importantly 
you know those centers that are doing cloning regularly will actually get better at it that is why the proseva trial which was then i think 11 french units all of them were experts at proning so you do it more you get better at proning proning comes with its own set of problems please understand proning can cause extreme hemodynamic instability and that's why it requires complete monitoring before you start proning them you require manpower it cannot be done by two people or three people you need a total of at least six to seven people one manning the airway the others managing the joints uh, one managing the tubes one managing the catheter and one uh, and another four of them turning these particular patients two of them turning three of them turning these patients so this is a this is a maneuver that takes a lot of manpower lot of manpower secondly all the tubes and and lines have to be secured doubly secured we don't say secured we said doubly secured that means tube to be doubly secured the lines to be doubly secured the lines to be carefully turned uh, and, and 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 it's very important to have the pressure points under control so these patients once they are prone they have to be kept like that they can't be turned remember this all your icu patients are turned every two hourly this is one category of patients in which you are not turning them too hourly. They are going to remain prone for a period of close to 12 to 16 hours. What the Proseva trial said, prone them for 16 hours and then make them supine because you want to do nursing activities. So 16 hours, you want to keep the patient prone. Okay, this means to say there is a very high chance of patient developing bed sores, especially in the pressure areas when the patient is prone. Not only that, when you are proning your patients, you normally want to paralyze them. So if you want to paralyze them, there is going to be chances of joint dislocation, especially the shoulder joint, the neck, all these problems can occur in these particular patients and hence it has to be done by a group of uh, doctors and, uh, and staff together to prone these patients. So all those patients who have got unstable spine, needless to say, those who have got rhythm that are unstable, who have got hypotension, who have got raised ICP, uh, who have got open abdomens, these are those patients in which you just cannot prone. These patients, you are you cannot prone these patients because uh, you may cause more damage otherwise. And if this patient arrests in prone, that is the end of it. You cannot really do any kind of CPR over here. When do I stop proning? I will stop proning when there is severe hemodynamic instability. I cannot prone these patients. I have to get them back to supine because this patient may arrest. He may require CPR, may require ECMO, may require anything. So for that reason, you have to keep this patient quickly and make them supine. If there is no improvement in oxygenation, don't just keep the patient prone. It is not going to help. It is going to damage only. So you have to notice an improvement in oxygenation by just turning your patient and then forgetting about it for the next 16 hours. That is wrong. Prone your patient and look after four hours whether there is an improvement in oxygenation. If there is no improvement in oxygenation, you have failed a proning trial. Please make the patient supine again. When do you stop this pronation? When you keep the patient supine and for four hours, the FIO2 is less than 0.6 and the PF ratios are more than 150. That is the time to call off your proning. You call off your proning when your PF ratios goes one the more than 150 and FIO2 less than 0 0.7, 0 0.6 for at least four consecutive hours in the supine position. You call off proning and stop proning your patients. Remember this, when you are proning your patients, it's important to feed them. It is very important to feed them when you are proning your patients. Um, and, and, and that's the way we should probably take care of proning. Well, I think uh, we've, we've covered peak pressure, we've covered plateau pressure, we've covered transpulmonary pressure. I think what have I left over here? I think negative inspiratory force. Oh, this is, I've left negative. So negative inspiratory force is, is, is one of the pulmonary function testing um, that can be used uh, in, in, uh, on a bedside. Now, where do we use negative inspiratory force? We may use it for weaning. So what is negative inspiratory? There's a button on your ventilator. It is also called as maximum inspiratory pressure in certain ventilators, MIP in certain ventilators, NIF in certain ventilators, where you just press the hold button. When you press the NIF button, a special procedure, or you press the hold button, the patient is instructed to take a deep breath. When the patient takes a deep breath, the pressures are actually monitored by the ventilator. And if it is close to minus 30, we would call it to be very good negative inspiratory force. All of us would have pressures of more than 100, 80 and 90. So anything more than minus 30 is actually very good negative inspiratory force. All that the negative inspiratory force tells you is your diaphragmatic power. It doesn't tell you anything more than that. That is why it is not a great test if you ask uh, if you ask us for weaning because for weaning or for intubation, you know, you should have a combination of inspiratory muscle strength, diaphragm and expiratory muscle strength. The NIF will give you an idea of the diaphragm and the cuff. 
that you will have of this patient after this patient has been extubated so you using uh, nif serially for our myasthenia gravis patients or our gbs patients to predict intubation is absolutely nonsense because if you keep doing that they will get fatigued and they'll get intubated so you can't keep doing the negative inspiratory force using a spirometer in patients of myasthenia gravis but yes it can be used in weaning that is you are about to wean your patients and you want to figure out whether your extubation predictors are are in line or not remember this all the extubation predictors have got an aoc curve somewhere between 50 and 65 and that's not very great you say they are great only when it is more than 88% so that means to say they may or may not extubate but and this is in the nif is somewhere around 60 which says that if it is more than minus 30 there is a reasonable chance that this patient will develop a good cough and thus you will have a good successful extubation i think with all this now covered peak pressure plateau pressure peep recruitment ppp nif p0.1 and proning uh, i would be glad to take some questions if there are any and if you want to uh, actually understand a little bit more about ventilation you can read a book that i have written a case based approach in uh, mechanical ventilation it most of the things that i have mentioned would also be figured out in this book um, also you could look at my slides on drsanjit.com and these lectures are freely available on this particular website also and feel free to go and have a look at it anytime it's it's a free website for educational purposes thank you very much and uh, arindam are there any questions that you want me to answer i'm there or uh, any other any of the students have any questions to answer any of the students uh, have any questions to ask i'll be glad to answer them uh if you could anybody who have answers please unmute yourself and you can ask me so uh, i see one uh, for weaning which is the best parameter uh, to be used well um, for weaning uh, there is no single parameter that we can use uh, for uh, for uh, understanding or predicting successful weaning for weaning you have to use multiple parameters together it is never a single parameter as i said the roc curve for almost every Uh, of these parameters are somewhere to the tune of 0.59 to 0.76 which means that they are not very good at telling you for certain that this patient will wean notwithstanding we have all the parameters and it is, should be a protocol to actually look at all the parameters starting from neurology which actually says conscious obeying commands which goes on to say uh, that the patient is generating an adequate cough by looking at the negative inspiratory force by looking at maximum inspiratory pressure or nif that is you can look at the rapid shadow breathing index now the rsvi is not supposed to be done with respect to uh, or by the when the patient is on the ventilator it has to be done ideally by a tp or the pressure support being as low as possible if the pressure support is as low as possible that is when you calculate your rapid shallow breathing index then will come the cuff leak test another test that cannot be done when the patient is actually getting weaned it has to be done just prior to weaning that means at that particular moment you will actually deflate the cuff when the patient is silent sleeping on a volume control mode of ventilation and you will notice the difference between expiratory volumes that you are getting and if the difference between expiratory volume before and after is 110 ml then the chance the cuff leak is pretty good and you may want to extubate your patient so if you ask me is there a single parameter that will actually uh, give me the best parameter for weaning no there is no single parameter it is a combination of all the parameters that will probably guide you towards a successful extubation i think any more questions uh, sir one question which is the best uh, parameter weaning dr jiokov uh, weaning would we have we to have two separate classes so i think we will discuss this on the winning classes anyone uh, dr jiokov you were asking some question you have to unmute sir you have to unmute okay someone was asking some question anyway otherwise um, for recruitment maneuver as paralysis required or not sanjit did I you answer this answered answered uh, that question i answered very slow waveforms correlation with work of breathing oh okay, that's answer. a very complicated question uh, there is something called as a campbell diagram when you actually talk about flow waveform and 
work of breathing you know um, it, 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 there's something called a campbell diagram yes by flow wave forms you can understand auto peep see basics are more important so when you have a flow wave form you can understand auto peep auto peep is no, known to generate a higher work of breathing on a pressure support mode so you can from a flow wave form understand an auto peep which can cause an increase in work of breathing similarly when there is a double trigger you can actually notice on flow flow wave form which is an asynchrony which actually is a increased work of breathing also uh, but there is something called as campbell diagram the campbell diagram is seen in certain form of ventilators research ventilators where you can actually look at the flow wave form and generate a work equation and understand work of breathing of course it is beyond the scope of this particular topic but yes we can use the flow flow wave forms and correlate that with the work of breathing but the pressure wave forms are much more better because when you have a pressure wave form that actually shows air hunger that means it is going the stress the, the wave form is not straight it is kind of curved then that will actually show you that there is air starvation air hunger inspiratory time being not okay and increased work of breathing Fair enough. If there are no more questions, then we would thank Dr. Sanjit to uh, explain us in such a good way. Sanjit, any besides your book, any other book which can give the pressures and manoeuvres or any other good articles, if you can send it to me, free articles or something, I can I share in the group itself. I will. I will send. Uh, I will send all the articles. I will number of articles that we can. Basic articles that we have. Uh, yes. which I can uh, send, yes. uh, send to you. I because this that. is a very basic program that we wanted yes. people to have a clear understanding. Yes. And uh, next year, we would wish to come up with an advanced course, right? So, which would be some advanced fellowship or something. So, let's, uh, uh, if you can kindly share. And thank you for coming. And uh, we'll have okay. a okay. chat. Okay. okay. Thank you. And so, uh, so thank you all. And uh, <laughs> We would connect next Tuesday. Thank you, Dr. Sanjit, once again. Thank you.